Um, so we are privileged to have uh, Spike here this evening. Uh, some of you may remember, maybe not, 10 years ago when we started this ministry. Uh, Spike was, we started on, in September of 2013, and we had Spike as a speaker in November of, the, of 2013. So he's, and he's been here a few times in between as well, but hasn't been here for a number of years now. He's uh, pretty busy in all the things that he's got going. So Spike has a um, bachelor's degree in electrical engineering, has done uh, studies in physics and his graduate studies in physics. And uh, he worked for the US space program for a number of years and gained a lot of experience about in astronomy there. And he has produced three DVDs on astronomy, which he will uh, uh, describe. And uh, Spike, in terms of testimony, he went into the U.S. space program as an atheist and as an evolutionist, and he came out of that program being challenged by a believer um, it, you know, on, on what he believed, and he came out as a creationist and a believer. And so uh, he's well qualified to speak on the topic we have at hand on distant starlight. How do we deal with that? How do we describe that from a bib biblical point of view? So, Spike, come on up. Thank you, Heinz. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having me tonight. It's my privilege to be here with you. Uh, as, the, as Heinz just said, and as that slide said, uh, I was indeed an atheist and an evolutionist, and I was an atheist because I was an evolutionist. I understood that science said quite clearly that there is no need for God, so why would you believe in one? And it wasn't after being confronted with evidence against my atheism and evolutionism and trying to disprove that for almost a year that I was confronted with the fact that the evidence is actually against atheism, against evolutionism, and for the Bible specifically. And I like to mention that when I speak for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, we're often told in this debate that Christians are creationists because we have to be because the Bible says that. That because we're pre-committed with faith in this book, that that puts blinders on us, and if we could take the blinders off and see all the evidence in the world for the millions of years and Darwinian processes and so on, then surely we would recognize that uh, that side is true. I'm one of many for whom the opposite is true, though. I became a creationist first because of the evidence, and that then opened the door to becoming a Christian. And I'm not alone in the creation movement. There's many others who followed a similar path. But that's why I do what I do, uh, to share some of the information that's out here on these type of subjects and show that this isn't, our, our faith is not blind. Science is on our side. Uh, having said that, there's, of course, science is a very large field. What questions do we talk about in a meeting like this? Well, there's very broad subjects, and then there's very narrow ones. And I have the privilege tonight of speaking on a more narrow topic than most, I suppose. I get to take a deep dive into one specific issue, which is that of distant starlight. Does it disprove biblical creation? And the question here is fairly straightforward. It's one of the most common questions asked uh, in this debate, is that how can we see light from these distant objects? I mean, light leaves a star in a distant galaxy and travels through space, and eventually, after traveling vast distances of space, we'll then arrive at Earth where we can perceive it, whether through a telescope or our unaided eye or whatever. And we're told that it must take long, long periods of time for light to travel these distances. Well, how would you make such a calculation? How would you know whether or not that's true? Well, this is a fairly straightforward idea. I mean, we do similar things in our daily lives every day. Uh, let's say you needed to drive 120 miles to get from home to wherever. If you could drive at 60 miles an hour, how long would it take you to make that trip? Maybe two hours, it's straightforward, right? What calculation are you performing to reach that conclusion? Well, time is the distance divided by the speed. In this case, 120 miles divided by 60 miles per hour equals two hours. We're going to use this same approach and apply it to distant starlight and see how long actually is needed for starlight to uh, transit over these long distances. Now, something that we'll be mentioning frequently here tonight is a light year. Uh, if you're not familiar with, with that term, it's confusing because it sounds like it's a measure of time because it's got the word year in it, it's actually a measure of distance. So a light year is the distance that light can travel in one year. And it's a very long distance, as you can imagine. I mean, light travels at 186,000, 
186,000 miles per second. So over the course of a year, light can travel a long distance, as you can imagine. Nevertheless, we can see objects that are quite far away. Not only close by stars, but even within our Milky Way galaxy, there's objects that are significantly far from us. For example, this is the Bubble Nebula here in our own Milky Way galaxy. Uh, estimates of distance vary, but it's between 7,000 to 11,000 light years from us. Thus, applying the calculation that we just talked about, let's say it's 10,000 light years away to make the math easier. If this object is 10,000 light years away, and light travels at one light year every year, then it's straightforward to say it, that would require 10,000 years for the light to get here. How can we therefore see it if the universe is only 6,000 years old, as the Bible would imply? And we'll talk about that in a moment. And this is just an object within our own Milky Way galaxy. There are galaxies outside of ours. For example, the, example, the Andromeda galaxy is two and a half million light years away. So it would seem that light would need two and a half million years to get here. And modern instruments have uh, enabled us to view uh, things even further in space. We now have adopt, adapt, excuse me, adaptive optics uh, in some observatories that use lasers to correct for atmospheric turbulence, thus allowing us to get even better images than we had before. And of course, we also have space telescopes. Never before in man's history have we been able to see so deeply into space and to see so well. And as we've used these instruments, we are seeing things farther and farther away. We're seeing galaxies over 13 billion light years away. A billion is a thousand million. So 13,200 million light years away, thus apparently needing 13.2 billion years to get here. And latest observations are pushing the boundaries even farther out to well above 13 billion light years at this point. So again, this raises the question, how can we see objects that apparently would need over 13 billion years for the light to get here if the universe is only thousands of years old? It seems like a straightforward issue and also a very serious problem for us as Bible-believing Christians. Uh, in fact, uh, as I mentioned, this is one of the most commonly asked questions about creation. And the atheists, of course, believe this is very important as well. There's an entire page on uh, this atheist wiki dedicated to it. They think that this alone is a complete showstopper for us. They don't need any other arguments, uh, according to some. This alone shows that the Bible or the biblical worldview is not correct. For our purposes tonight, I'm going to abbreviate this issue as LTT, standing for light travel time. How do we account for long periods of time for light to travel in a young universe? Well, why does this even matter to us in the first place? It matters because the Bible talks indirectly, not directly, but indirectly, about how long ago the creation occurred. Adam was created roughly 6,000 years ago. Now, the Bible doesn't give a date for him, but it does give genealogies subsequent to him. And when you add up all the numbers, you arrive at Adam being created roughly 6,000 years ago. The Bible also says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, familiar verse to us, I would hope. God created man in his own image. And when he saw everything that he had made, behold, it was very good, and the evening and morning were the sixth day. So Adam was created on the sixth day after creation itself, after the creation of everything, I should say. And then subsequently to then, 6,000 years more or less have passed. Now, some people say, well, maybe that six days of creation in the beginning were long, indefinite periods of time. Maybe it's not literal days. Maybe we can fit the billions of years in there somehow. Well, that's not an option for us either. In Mark chapter 10, Jesus was having a conversation, and his opponents that he was arguing with said, they said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, he wrote this commandment for you because of your hard hearts. But, speaking of Adam and Eve now, at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Jesus confirmed Adam and Eve were created right at the beginning of everything, not billions of years after the creation. I, and I brought this up to some people, and someone actually said, well, maybe Jesus didn't know when God created Adam and Eve. And I said, well, that's an even bigger problem for, for, than the creation issue because Jesus, of course, is the creator, right? All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So if the creation is roughly 6,000 years old, how then do we account for this LTT issue? Is it really a fatal challenge to biblical creation? Well, of course, there's no surprise here. I wouldn't be here speaking to you tonight if that were the case. 
In talking to a skeptic about this, and they bring this point up, you can say, wait a minute, not so fast. This is not a challenge only for me. This is also a challenge for you because this challenge actually applies to everybody, not only biblical Christians. What do I mean by that? Well, let's talk for a moment about the Big Bang model. This, is, this topic tonight is not about the Big Bang specifically. I do have other presentations just on that issue. And the Big Bang has lots of problems. Um, but one of the problems that I will talk about is the CMB, the Cosmic Microwave Background. When we look out into space, there's microwave radiation coming to Earth from all directions in space. And if you imagine us being the inside of a sphere, where the inside of the sphere is all the heavens, open up that sphere and unwrap it, and you would get this oval shape, right? That's what this map is. So this is a map of the sky and the radiation coming to us from all points. The different colors represent small variations in temperature. So why is this important? Because this radiation is supposedly the afterglow of the Big Bang. Roughly 400,000 years or so, a little bit less than that, after the Big Bang was supposed to have occurred, this cosmic microwave background was formed, and we are uh, viewing it today, um, almost 14 billion years later. Now, the Big Bang model says that that early in the universe's history, there had not yet been enough time for light to travel all the way across the entire cosmos. And again, I'm speaking in the context of the Big Bang model here. This is very early after the Big Bang, and so light couldn't travel very far at all. Furthermore, the Big Bang model says that the universe started out with variations in temperature at different places. Therefore, if it started out with variations in temperature, and if there wasn't enough time for light to travel very far before this CMB was formed, then there wasn't enough time for heat to travel either, so the unevenness of heat couldn't have been evened out. I know I'm using the word even and not a lot there. Point is, the heat energy could not have distributed itself evenly throughout the cosmos by the time the CMB formed. This is what the Big Bang model says. That means that the Big Bang model predicts we should still see temperature variations in the CMB today. The problem for the Big Bang model is that we don't. The entire universe, the entire CMB, is roughly the same temperature. I say roughly, I mean, it's to within one thousandth of a degree. Very, very tiny variations. This does not match what the Big Bang model predicts. This actually is sufficient all by itself to disprove the Big Bang model. This is called the horizon problem, by the way, if you wanted to look this up. Light has apparently traveled across the entire universe because the entire universe has arrived at the same temperature. That means heat has been able to flow from the hotter areas to the colder areas to bring everything to the same temperature. But in the Big Bang model, there hasn't been enough time to do that. Not back then when the CMB was formed, and it also couldn't have happened since then, by the way, either. Point is, the Big Bang model predicts variations in temperature because there hasn't been enough time for heat to travel across to even everything out, but that's not what we see. Now, of course, secular cosmologists are aware of this. They say they have a solution called cosmic inflation. That has a whole basket of problems all by itself. It's the idea that the universe somehow inf started to inflate at many times the speed of light early in the universe's history, and then decided to stop doing that afterwards for whatever, and has gone on since then. It's a very contrived proposal. Uh, even some of its early architects of that theory have abandoned it since because it's gotten so contrived. Uh, nevertheless, you will be told it's true because we know the Big Bang happened, and that's the only way to get around the horizon problem. So while resisting the temptation to talk more about inflation and all of its problems, I'll just point out the Big Bang model has a light travel time problem of its own. It, too, has to explain how heat and therefore light could have traveled across the entire cosmos even when the model doesn't provide enough time for that to have happened. So the broader point here is that LTT is not just an issue for biblical Christians, it's an issue for everyone. We're on an evil, even playing field here. The skeptic doesn't get to point his finger at us and say, ha-ha, gotcha, because he's got the same problem. Having said that, I'm now going to talk about why it's not really a problem for us. We aren't on the defensive here. There are actually multiple possible solutions, and that will be the point of my presentation here this evening. The LTT challenge, as I'm going to refer to it, is based actually on seven assumptions. It seems like a straightforward problem, doesn't it? We see faraway objects. I mean, that's only four words. <laughs> that sort of implies there's been time for the light to get here. But as simple and straightforward as the problem seems, it's actually quite subtle, and there's seven assumptions built into it. 
All seven of those assumptions must be true or the challenge itself falls apart. It's invalidated. Now, I'm going to talk about all seven. It turns out one of them appears to be reasonable. All the rest can be questioned, and at least one of them is actually false. That means the LTT challenge itself is not valid. So what do I mean when I say there's assumptions? Well, let's go back to our equation here, time equals distance over speed. Let's talk about the speed for a moment. This calculation assumes that the speed of light hasn't changed, right? What if the speed of light has decreased through history? What if it used to be faster in the past and is now slower than it used to be? That would mean what? It would mean light could travel farther back then than it could for the same amount of time today, right? So you see this idea by questioning this assumption of constant light speed through time would therefore make this challenge go away. And indeed, this idea was seriously looked at a number of years ago. Uh, there was a lot of interest in it in creation circles. Upon subsequent examination, this idea didn't really hold up, and so most creationists today would um, not question that assumption anymore. I wanted to mention it first for a couple of reasons. Number one, a lot of people have heard of this idea because, as I said, it was quite popular. Number two, you, you see how this is a crucial assumption. The LTT challenge requires that the speed of light hasn't changed, otherwise the challenge itself falls apart, doesn't it? Now, as I said, apparently this is a true assumption, but this is the only one of the seven that we can say that of. I'm not saying they're all false, uh, but I'm saying they're not, all not, they're not necessarily all of them are true, but at least one of them is false, as we'll see in a moment. So this is, will be the structure for the rest of my time here this evening. We're going to go through all seven assumptions. We just did number one. You see, that was pretty simple, right? So now we're going to do the remaining six and see how they withstand scrutiny, if indeed they are able to do so. So let's move on to the second assumption. Back to our equation. It's a simple equation. What are the things can we challenge within it? Well, let's talk about the speed again. In order to, the, to do this calculation, you need to know the speed of light, don't you? Now, you can look up the speed of light in Wikipedia or physics book or whatever, and you'll be told it's 186,000 miles per second. That's actually not the speed that goes into this equation, though. The speed that you get when you look it up in a reference somewhere is the two-way speed of light. The speed of light that's measured when it goes out and is reflected back to you and you use the same clock to measure when it left and when it arrived again. But that's not what's at play in this equation, is it? This equation is how long light took to travel in one direction only, from out there to here. What is the one-way speed of light? We don't know. We've never measured it, not because it's too difficult, but because it's impossible. It is physically impossible to measure the one-way speed of light. If you look at all the various approaches that have been tried, you first have to assume that you know what it is and assume a number for it before you can do the experiment and get a calculation that tells you what the number is. And it turns out the number that you assume at the beginning is always the number you get from the experiment. This is a famous problem in physics. It's actually been around for quite some time. There's a whole Wikipedia page dedicated to it. And it may not make sense to you. It's like, well, why would it be different in one when it only travels in one direction. Uh, it's not that it really, quote unquote, travels at a different speed in one direction only. It's that when you do a calculation using this number, you have to choose the number first before you can do the calculation. And it turns out, regardless of the numbers you choose to use, as long as you set up your experiment and your calculation so that the numbers always average out to the known two-way two -way speed, two-weed, <laughs> two-way speed, then it works. There's actually entire YouTube videos dedicated to this. And for examples, um, more practical example, there's a spacecraft that left Earth and is going somewhere, and we want to talk to the astronauts. We can now radio waves travel at the speed of light. So we can assume that the radio wave travels at the same speed in both directions, and then we know that when our message is transmitted, and when they receive it, and when they answer back to us, and so on. And, and we also can figure out like where to aim the signal so it'll arrive to where they are when they get it. But you can also make the assumption that light, 
and radio waves travel infinitely fast to them and then slower on the way back so that you get the same, the same average, the known number, and it turns out everything works out exactly the same. You will still be able to communicate with the astronauts. And they'll still be able to communicate with you if they make different assumptions. As long as you're consistent with the assumptions you make, it always works. Now, I know this is probably getting confusing, but my point is the one-way speed of light is not a known number that you can measure. It's physically impossible to measure it. You have to assume what it is before you can do any experiments. And assuming different numbers always works as long as you're consistent in how you apply them. So to make this calculation using the one-way speed of light is impossible. This equation assumes that the speed of light in one direction only is both absolute and known, and it is not. It is neither absolute nor is it known. So you can't do the calculation because it's impossible to do it. It requires a number that we don't know and cannot know because it's impossible to know. So back to our assumptions, this was assumption number two, that the one-way speed of light is absolute and then we know what it is. You need to know that number to do the calculation. And we don't know it because we can't know it. It's impossible to know it. Now, we could actually stop the presentation right here because this alone is enough to invalidate the LTT challenge. But having said that, even if we assume that we do know the one-way speed, there's other problems with this challenge as well. Let's go back to our equation. Time equals distance over speed. What about the distance? Is, can that be challenged? Sometimes people wonder, uh, is it possible that these objects aren't actually as far away from us as they are claimed to be? There is some uncertainty in the measurements in, in many cases, but we're, you're only talking about a few percentage points for the most part. These objects are indeed vast distances away from us, certainly a lot farther than 6,000 light years in most cases. So yes, the objects are far away, but this calculation assumes that the light had to travel across the entire distance to get here from there. What if that weren't true? What if instead light beams were created as full light beams? And you've probably heard this idea because it's been popular in Christian circles for a while. And the argument goes something like this. If the heavens are to declare the glory of God, shouldn't they do so right away? When Adam woke up on day six, on that night, could he see stars in the sky? And the Bible doesn't say so, but it seems reasonable to say that he did. So the light had to be there for him. So why wouldn't the Lord create a fully functional, mature creation? So that it could serve his purposes. Sometimes people call this the appearance of age idea, um, but people who hold to this generally prefer calling it mature creation because it's better description and uh, includes the description of why God would do it that way in the first place. And the adherence of this model, let me, actually, let me, let me back up a minute. As I discuss these assumptions tonight, I forgot to mention this earlier, I'm going to present different models for you. I have my own ideas on this subject, but I'm not endorsing any particular one tonight. I'm trying to keep my ideas private. <laughs> my goal is not to, to sell you on one particular solution to this issue. My goal is to show you all of the different approaches that people are taking. And by people, I, I mean all of these models that I'm showing you, there's been a credentialed scientist in the creation movement advocating it. By credentialed, I mean a PhD in astrophysics, physics, or astronomy. So I'm not trying to convince you of any one particular solution. I'm trying to show you of all the different approaches that are, that are being discussed and some of the pros and cons of them so you can make up your own mind. So for this particular model, the, those who adhere to it, again, prefer to call it mature creation, which I think is a good description. And they correctly point out that mature creation is, is necessary for at least some of God's creation. It's certainly necessary for the earth. I mean, when Adam woke up on day six, was there a pile of nuts and seeds next to him that he had to go plant? No, he woke up with functional, you know, fully mature fruit trees and other plants that he could consume and eat from. So uh, in that sense, the plants were created mature and you know, the water in the river didn't, or, uh, the water in the river was flowing already. He didn't have to wait for it to start flowing out of the mountains upstream and so on. So the earth at least had to be created mature. Why not stars and starlight as well? Having said that, not everyone in the creation movement likes this idea, and they have some fairly strong objections. 
uh, one of the strongest is that this would make God a deceiver. It would make God deceptive. Why do they say that? Well, as an example, this is a supernova called Supernova 1987A. Uh, it was observed occurring in 1987, as you might gather from the name. We saw a star blow up in a violent supernova explosion. And since 1987, we've been observing the remnant expand and change over time. And so there's actually some interesting physics going on here that we're learning from. Point is, we saw the star, and then we saw the star blow up. And not only did we see it blow up, we also got particles accompanying the image of the explosion when it arrived here. Now, this star is roughly 168,000 light years away from us. If God created all the starlight as full beams in place as part of the mature creation idea, what was created in the case of this object? Well, there would be a beam of light going between us and it, and this beam of light would be 168,000 light years long, right? Because that's how far away this object is. The first 6,000 light years, more or less, of that beam contained the image of a star, because we saw the star. As time went on, the Earth was basically consuming this light beam as it was flowing toward us. And no extra charge for the Hollywood quality of graphics here, by the way. <laughs> so you see, consuming the light beam, and again, we're still consuming that image of the star. Not that anyone on Earth had telescopes at the time to, to perceive that, but nevertheless, that's what was happening. And then in 1987, the image of the star changed to an image of a supernova. Problem with this, according to people who don't like this idea, is that this idea means the star never existed. We were watching a movie of it for, for 6,000 years, but the light beam itself is 168,000 light years long. So the first 6,000 years worth of the beam that we consumed had a picture of a star that never existed. <laughs> Furthermore, the supernova didn't happen either. In fact, we're not going to see anything real for another 162,000 years because it'll take us that long to consume the rest of the light beam that hasn't arrived here yet. What's at the other end? We have no idea, and we're not going to find out for a long time. So people who don't like mature creation say God, this would make God a deceiver because all these things we see in the heavens never actually existed. You see the problem there? Now, the counter-objection to that from people who like this idea is that, well, God's not a deceiver if he told us what's going on. Like, was Adam deceived by the mature fruit trees? Even it looked four or five years old when he woke up next to one? No, because God said, I made this on day three. In similar way, God told us he created the cosmos 6,000 years ago, so we shouldn't be deceived by false assumptions about how light beams and such are working. Furthermore, saying that mature creation applies only to Earth actually doesn't go far enough. There's actually a precedent for applying it to stars as well because there's at least one star where mature creation apparently would need to apply. Our sun produces light deep inside of itself, and it turns out that the light that it produces from nuclear fusion takes a while to work its way out to the surface. Now, once it reaches the surface, it shoots dust through space at the speed of light and, reach, and reaches here in a little over eight minutes. But it actually takes thousands of years, if we understand the physics correctly, for the light, once it's produced, to work its way up to the surface and then shoot to us quickly. So could Adam see the sun when he woke up on day six? I think so. But sunlight produced by the sun wouldn't have been available to any human for thousands of years. Possibly not even yet, because some estimates say it takes uh, up to 10,000 years for light to work its way out and come to us through space. So you understand the difference, right? Once it reaches the surface, it shoots to us at the speed of light. But for various reasons, the light gets absorbed, re-emitted, absorbed, re-emitted on the way out, and it takes up to 10,000 years for the sunlight to reach the surface. So in a sense, all the sunlight that we're still consuming today had to be initially created by God farther out from the, uh, the center of the sun, and the sun's actual sunlight that it's actually making, we haven't seen any of that yet. So mature creation would seem to be necessary for at least our sun. Why not the other stars too? 
So again, I'm not endorsing or denying this particular model. I'm, I'm showing you the pros and cons so you can understand the discussion that's going on. But it is clear, hopefully though, that this is the third necessary assumption in the LTT challenge, that the universe was not creative and sure. Because if it were creative and sure, then the challenge is invalidated. So what other assumptions can we find in the LTT challenge? Well, let's go back to our equation and let's talk about the distance again. And a similar question, did the light actually travel that distance in the way that we understand? What do I mean by that? Well, a few years back, a Bible-believing astronomer, Dr. Daniel Faulkner, noticed something interesting in the book of Genesis. In the, in the creation account, it says, God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed and the fruit tree, and the earth brought forth grass and, and herb yielding seed after his kind and the tree, etc." Many of us tend to think of these creation events as ex nihilo, from nothing. God said, let there be plants, and poof, there was plants. Is that what the text actually says, though? No. God commanded the earth, bring forth plants, and the earth brought them forth. The Hebrew word here for brought forth is called is, uh, dasha. So Dr. Faulkner started wondering, it, it sounds like the earth brought forth plants in a normal way, like the earth is doing today, but God commanded it to happen very quickly so that it all happened on day three. So apparently plant production was a normal process that was just accelerated for God's purposes during creation week. And he started wondering, what if that happened on day four also? What if God commanded the stars, bring forth starlight? And lo, they did. This means that this, the starlight we see was actually produced by stars, so God is not deceiving us. The supernova actually happened, and the star that we saw before the supernova actually existed. But God used supernatural processes to quickly bring that light to us all on day four. Now, some people don't like this idea. A skeptic, of course, wouldn't like this idea because it's explicitly miraculous. This is not trying to use physics to, uh, to explain how this could have happened. This is just saying God performed a miracle and brought the light here all on day four. And yes, indeed, this is a miraculous process, but as, Christ as Christians, we shouldn't be ashamed of that. Even when talking to a skeptic, you can point out, yes, this is a miraculous process. Well, so is the universe. Any secular cosmology, if you think about it, actually includes miracles as well, whether or not the skeptics want to admit that, because the, the Big Bang model, for example, violates laws of physics early on in the model, and if you're violating laws of physics, you're kind of by definition performing a miracle, right? So in a sense, everyone believes in miracles, whether you believe God brought the universe into existence or whether you believe it created itself, there's miracles in both models. The difference is miracles are consistent with our viewpoint, but inconsistent with theirs. So the fact that it's miraculous and a miraculous explanation shouldn't bother us. Uh, one thing, though, that some people have pointed out is that even if this idea were correct, there's no way to actually test it, because there's no scientific experiment you can run to verify that a miracle happened if you don't understand what that process was. So although this may be a correct explanation, it perhaps isn't as useful as a scientific model because there's no scientific prediction you can make and test. So those are the pros and cons of what's being called Dasha cosmology. And you see how that's an important assumption in the LTT challenge, the assumption that light has always traveled through space across that entire distance as it does today. So that's four assumptions. What else can we glean from this challenge? Back to our equation, let's talk about the speed again. What if the speed is variable? What if the speed is not constant? We talked about this before, and we said that the idea that it's changed through time apparently isn't uh, a valid thing to be investigating because it seems to be a reasonable assumption. What if, however, it's variable not through time, but through space? What if the speed of light varies according to your location? Let's think about this. Where have we ever measured the speed of light? Where have all of our measurements been done from? Earth, from within our solar system and our solar system is within the Milky Way galaxy. What is the speed of light outside of the galaxy? We have no idea. We've never been there. 
and we have no hope of, of ever getting there for that matter. Why is this an interesting thing to be thinking about? Because relativity tells, tells us that space, space time, slow my speaking here, space time behaves essentially as a fabric. Mass distorts the fabric of space time, and we'll talk more about this here in a moment. We know that this actually affects the path of light beams. Light will be bent around massive objects in space. This is called gravitational lensing. Einstein's relativity predicted this, and it's subsequently been observed, and there's actually lots of examples of this. If you look it up, you can find lots of pictures. There are examples where there's a galaxy here, and then from our point of view, there's another galaxy behind this one that we can't see, but we can still get partial images from it because the light from this one is going out and being bent by the gravity of the closer one and then being focused onto the Earth. Gravitational lensing if you've heard of that. So if gravity can affect light's path, could it also affect its speed? Well, if, if gravity slowed down light, that means light would travel more quickly in places where there's, it's not as affected by gravity. Like deep space, for example, in between galaxies where there's no objects to produce gravity to slow the light down. Is the speed of light the same out there in deep intergalactic space? Or is it faster? We don't know. But it is a possibility that's been gaining attention in the creation movement lately. And in a sense, we're actually latecomers to the game because secular cosmologists have been talking about this for quite some time. Now, their motives are different than ours. They're actually trying to solve some problems in the Big Bang model with this idea. But my point is, this isn't some fringe idea that creationists came up with. There are, there are quite a few scientists looking into the idea that maybe light travels more quickly through deep space where it's not as affected by gravity. You can see then how that would speed up its path toward us, or its travel time toward us, and shorten the time it needs to get here, right? This is called VSOL, variable speed of light. So that's questioning the other assumption in our list here. The assumption that light speed is constant across space. If that weren't true, and it may not be true, as I said, as being investigated, then the LTT challenge doesn't work. What else can we glean? Looks like I'm missing a bullet point on my slide here. Oops. What else can we glean from this? Well, we've talked about distance and we've talked about speed. Can we question time in this equation? Where can we go with that? Well, when we tend to, th to think about the creation account, we tend to think it happened from inner to outer. I'll, I'll show you what I mean by that in just a moment. What if that's not true? What if it's actually outer to inner? So here's what I mean. We tend to think that the Earth was created on the inside of the cosmos, in a sense, at least from our perspective. You know, we're here, and then the Lord created all the stuff out there. So working from inwards to outwards. What if he actually went the opposite sequence? What if instead he created an outer shell, if you will, of galaxies, and then moving his focus inwards toward the center where the Earth will be, and moving his focus to the speed of light, he created another shell and another shell, and so the light from the outermost ones is moving inward as he's creating new ones along the path, adding more light to it, until day four of creation week when the earth gets created and all the starlight arrives here, excuse me, until day four of creation week when the earth had already been here for several days, but on day four, all that starlight from all the galaxies arrives here from all directions simultaneously. And the night sky went from being empty to suddenly, abruptly being full. Because on the fourth day, the sky was empty and then suddenly everything appeared. So from the earth, perspective from an observer on Earth, that's when creation would have happened, the fourth day. Because you look at an empty sky and then suddenly, boom, it's full of galaxies, stars, and everything else. Now when we suggest this to someone, and Christians, of course, will often say, wait a minute, this implies the galaxies were created before the Earth, billions of years before. Because it took that long for the create everything on the way in 
changing the focus, uh, if you will, at the speed of light. Is this a good explanation, changing the focus? You understand what I'm saying? Create the outer shell and then inner shell, but doing that in sync with all the light that's starting to travel inward? This does indeed suggest, in a way, that the galaxies were created first, but only from a certain perspective. From the Earth's perspective, the Earth existed for a number of days, the sky was empty, nothing else existed, and then suddenly the sky was full. Nevertheless, people don't like, often, the idea that these other galaxies were created first, before the Earth, because they're thinking in terms of an absolute clock. Now, from an observer perspective, from an observer clock, if you will, everything was created on day four. Uh, everything in, in the sky, I mean. But people still tend to say, wait, but from, but from an absolute overall perspective, the galaxies are first, and that doesn't really match Genesis. Everyone see the issue here? Well, we're applying our everyday thinking to the cosmos when we make that statement, or maybe make that objection, I should say. And that's not necessarily a valid way to do it. Not absolutely, at least. So what do we mean by that? There's two ways of interpreting the things you experience in life. Okay? So here's a, here's a question. I know this is re being recorded, and for people who are watching this in the room with me, are you experiencing this as a live event in real time? Or are you watching a recording of me? Oh, you're, you're experiencing this as a live event, right? But are you really? Does, is the speed of sound infinite? Or does it take a small amount of time for my voice to travel from where I am to where you are? It takes a small amount of time, right? There's a delay. So are you thinking that you're really only watching kind of a recording of this, a fraction of a second after it's all actually happening? No. You consider that you're experiencing this as it happens, right? Now, in real life, this doesn't matter because that little time delay is insignificant. On an astronomical scale, though, it does matter. You have to choose which way to interpret the events. If you see an, an eclipse of the sun, solar eclipse, when the moon travels in between us and the sun and blocks out the sun's disk. When the, if you haven't seen one, by the way, make the effort. There's another one coming to the US here shortly. It's worth traveling to go see it. Because when it first fully covers the sun, that first moment of totality is breathtaking. But if you experience that, do you grumble and say, well, it looks kind of impressive, but it takes more than a second for the light to get here from the moon, so I'm watching this event in a one second time delay, and so I'm not really experiencing it. No, of course not. You enjoy it as you experience it, right? That's when you consider it as happening. If you get to see Venus transiting across the face of the sun, which happens very rarely, the next event is, I believe, the year 2117, when Venus travels in between us and the sun. That's Venus right there. Very rare event. You're very blessed to see it because it happens so infrequently. But if you do get to see it, do you grumble and complain because, well, it took over two minutes of the light to get here. I'm not really getting to see it. This is like a recording. No. As you experience it, that's when you consider it happening. For that, and we do this all the time in astronomy even. This supernova was named what? 1987A because we experienced it, we observed it in the year 1987. Did we call it supernova 166,000 BC? Because that's when it really happened? No. We label it according to when we experienced it. So that same logic, saying that, well, the galaxies being created first doesn't match Genesis, that's not a valid objection. Because if you were on Earth at that time, you would have seen an empty sky, nothing existed yet, and then suddenly on day four, boom, there's a sky full of stars and galaxies. So that's when you consider creation of those objects to have happened. So I'm saying that there's no absolute sequence of time when it comes to the cosmos. You can choose to do it in several different ways. So the idea that galaxies were created out there on the way into Earth and all the light arriving here at the same time, I'm arguing that that does not violate the creation account in Genesis. If you're still unsure about this, and you may be, I mean, don't be embarrassed, a lot of people got to grapple with this, ask me during Q&A, and I'll, we'll do a demonstration up here on stage to show you that on cosmic distance scales, our normal ideas about before and after 
no longer apply absolutely. So I won't take the time now to do it because I want to make sure people are interested in it. If not, I won't spend the time. For now, I'll just point out that that is another assumption built into this challenge that we have to use an absolute sequence for ordering events in the cosmos, and that's not necessarily true. So that's six assumptions so far, and I said there were seven. What else can we possibly get out of this one simple equation? Well, one more thing we can do is again to question time. In a different way, though. We're going to talk about a phenomenon called time dilation, which sounds weird, but is actually a real thing in physics. Turns out that gravity affects time. Einstein's relativity predicts this, predicted this, and then subsequently was verified by experiment over and over and over again. The stronger the gravitational field is, wherever you are, the slower time flows for you. And if that sounds like a weird concept, here's another way to put it. Every possible clock you could possibly build, whether it was based on mechanical gears or atomic processes or flowing water or whatever, every possible clock that's possible to build is going to operate more slowly when, there's, when gravity is stronger. Uh, this is, as I mentioned, this has been verified by experiment. For example, the most, some of the most accurate clocks we can build currently are atomic cesium clocks. There's several of them around the world. We have a couple here in the U.S. There's one in Boulder, Colorado, a mile or so above sea level. And there's one in Maryland, close to sea level, very close. The one at sea level ticks, atomic clock doesn't really tick, but the one at sea level ticks a little more slowly than the one in Boulder. Why is that? Because it's deeper into the Earth's gravitational field. The one in Boulder is higher, thus slightly less gravity, and thus slightly faster time there. Sounds weird, but it's true. In fact, some of our technology has to compensate for this in order to work. I'm showing you a GPS satellite here. The GPS system relies on accurate calibration of clocks between the device in your pocket and several satellites up there. Them being out in space means they are farther out of the Earth's gravitational field than we are down here with our phones. Turns out that time flows more quickly for the satellites than it does for us. And the GPS system has to compensate for this, otherwise, this, otherwise the calculations wouldn't work. This is called gravitational time dilation, and it actually inter it speeds up clocks on the GPS satellites relative to us by about 45 microseconds per day. Uh, the net, incidentally, is a little bit less than that because there's a second effect that counteracts some of it. But overall, GPS has to compensate for a difference in 38 microseconds per day between their clocks out in space and our clocks here in our pockets on our devices. So point is, gravity affects time. The more gravity there is, the slower time goes. Why are we talking about this? Because a few years ago, a Bible-believing physicist noticed that a number of places in the Bible, it says that God, the Lord, created the heavens and stretched them out. You've probably have seen verses like this, right? There's more than one. And he started to wonder, what would that look like? If, is this poetry? Or did God actually stretch something out during creation week? Well, if he stretched it out, then that means it started out in a smaller volume. So what would that imply? Well, if the volume of stuff in the early universe was small enough, that would place the universe inside of a black hole. And that has some interesting implications. Now, black holes are really mysterious objects. Gravity is so strong that even light can't escape, which is why they appear to be black, because you can't see it. No light comes directly to us from there. But we can see the effects that they have on their environment. Uh, a star that travels too close to a black hole will actually be ripped apart and form what's called an accretion disk. This is an artist's illustration here, um, but we do actually observe accretion disks at some places in the cosmos. This is M87. Uh, M and this actually turns out a monster black hole at the center of our own Milky Way galaxy. But among their other weird effects, not only can black holes rip things apart that get too close, they also, because of their gravity, have an effect on time. If you were unlucky enough to approach a black hole, from the perspective of someone outside observing this, time for you would slow down. Your clocks would run slower and slower until you reached the boundary of the black hole, at which point 
time would stop for you. So, back to our proposal from the physicist. He, he realized that if the universe was in a small enough volume to begin with, then it would be inside of a black hole, the boundary of which is represented here by the dotted line. Now, this is called the event horizon. It's not a physical thing. It's not a shell or something. It's just a distance. Within this distance from the center of the black hole, that's where all the black hole weirdness is going on. Now, let's say the Lord stretched out the universe. And this takes a miracle, of course, because black holes don't expand. But the Lord being the Lord, he can do that if he wants to. So if he stretches out the heavens and starts to create things from the matter in the heavens, at this point, everything is still within the black hole. But as he keeps stretching, eventually some material moves outside of the event horizon, therefore outside the black hole, which causes the event horizon to shrink. So the black hole gets smaller. And here's where it gets interesting, because now some galaxies are outside the black hole, while the rest, including our Milky Way galaxy, is still inside. And remember, we talked about gravity and time. Time is now flowing normally out here, whereas inside the black hole, it's still essentially stopped. The Lord continues stretching. More stuff moves outside the black hole. Black hole continues to shrink. Time is still passing out there. Time is still stopped inside. As the Lord continues stretching, eventually enough material moves out of the event horizon that the black hole dissipates. It goes away, and all the black hole weirdness stops happening. From this point onwards, time is flowing uniformly throughout the entire cosmos. Uh, unless you're close to a massive object that it affects you slightly. But overall, time is now flowing normally. But what happened up to this point? Lots and lots of time happened out here, whereas nothing happened here where we are. So millions or even billions of years could pass in the far outer regions of the cosmos, giving enough time for light to travel to here from there, also giving time for other things to happen out there, like galaxy collisions and things that seem to need long periods of time, while on Earth, one day passed, this proposal is based, again, on gravitational time dilation. Dr. Humphreys, the physicist that we've, uh, whose idea we're talking about, has actually taken this model in other directions since this first one. His subsequent ideas are quite a bit more complicated, though, so rather than talk about those, I like talking about his first model because it illustrates the basic concept. Point is, depending on how the Lord distributed the matter, the stuff in the early universe, time will flow differently in different places. So you can see how that opens up all sorts of possibilities for modeling how starlight could travel, right? Because that is indeed the seventh assumption built into the LTT challenge, the assumption that time has always flowed uniformly throughout the cosmos. And depending on how the initial universe was, its mass was distributed, that's not necessarily true. So in our session, we've gone through all seven of these assumptions. I pointed out that number one is probably correct. I don't have a problem with it personally. But all seven have to be correct in order for the challenge itself to be valid. We know number two for sure is incorrect. And the others can be challenged as well. So when addressing distant starlight, does it actually disprove biblical creation? No, it doesn't. There's lots of possibilities here. And again, I'm not suggesting any one model is the best one. I have my, my favorite. But you can see how there's multiple possible approaches to this problem. As uh, Gary Bates from Creation Ministries International likes to say, this is a great time to be a biblical creationist. Go back 20 years and people were saying mature creation was really the only option we had. Now there's, well, maybe longer than 20 years, a bit longer than that. But now there's al almost too many options, right? Maybe the, uh, maybe the actual solution is something we haven't even considered yet. Or maybe it's a combination of several of them. My point is this is not a showstopper for us multiple possible approaches, and it's exciting and fascinating to discuss this. Having so many potential solutions is not a bad thing, it's a good thing, because it allows us to contrast and compare, look at the advantages and disadvantages of each, and come up with the best possible solution. Which we can do because this is not a fatal challenge for us. The heavens declare the glory of God, and good science, true science, that, that looks at the universe dispassionately and objectively, is always going to support that. We shouldn't be afraid of what science shows us because science is on our side.
But as you can guess, that's probably an unusual statement in today's culture. Um, and this is certainly an unusual perspective on astronomy that you've received here tonight. Uh, if this is new to you, and you like this sort of thing, then I recommend my website to you, creationastronomy.com. At the bottom of each page, there's a form to get my free email newsletter. It only comes out a few times a year at this point, so you won't be deluged with spam or anything. But as things are discovered that are relevant to origins, I send out an email about them. So if you'd like to be notified of those sorts of things when new articles are available, feel free to sign up for that. Also, as Heinz mentioned, I do have a three-part video series on astronomy. Uh, the presentation tonight is actually going to be the basis of the fourth volume in this series. But the three cover other topics in a, from a similar perspective. Number one is about the solar system. This is a full presentation, over two hours long, goes through each planet in the solar system one by one, discusses many of their moons as well, and shows how each one discredits secular ideas about where they came from and how they formed and how long ago that happened. So that's the first volume in that series. It's actually a two-disc set because it didn't all fit on one disc. Volume two in the series talks about stars and galaxies and asks similar questions. What about stars? Where did they come from? Did they form billions of years ago? What about galaxies? Can you explain their existence using natural processes? Is there evidence of design in our sun? The answer is yes, by the way. Something a lot of people don't talk about. Volume three then covers the Big Bang model. Did the universe create itself 14 billion years ago? Or does that actually violate the laws of physics? Is there evidence against that idea? And the answer is yes. So that's the subject of that one. So what do the heavens declare? Not the Big Bang model. The heavens declare the glory of his creator, of their creator. So here's my site again. I'll leave that up in case you wanted to take a picture or make a note of it or whatever. That brings me to the end of my prepared material. I thank you very much for your attention. And I will turn it over to Heinz now. I think we'll have some, some Q&A. Thank you, Spike. Let's so give, give him a hand for the presentation. Thank you. That, that was a, a lot to take in, obviously. A lot of uh, physics there. And uh, some of these, if you have a question, raise your hand and I'll bring the mic around. So I see one question back there. But ju just to, one comment I have is, you know, some of these things I haven't, I've heard a lot of these presentations, but some of these things are new. Mm -hmm. How much has this been distributed amongst other astronomers? You know, like Humphreys, for example, and um, some of these ideas that you have here. Some of them are older and some of them are newer. I mean, as you're aware, Dr. Humphreys uh, first presented this in the 90s, I think it was been 90s, yeah. the time dilation. Whereas the variable speed of light uh, has been getting a lot less attention because it's fairly recent in, in our circles. The secular cosmologist has been talking about it for a while, yeah. but it wasn't until the last ICC, um, which I showed a paper from, that it really got any kind of uh, official discussion within our circles. Um, so it, it, it would depend on which idea you were talking about as to how long it's been around, I guess. Yeah. Okay, for those you know, people around here, there, there is, um, you mentioned Russ Humphreys. He's one of the main um, proposers of different models, and he actually will be in town in the middle of August, so, and I will put that out in our um, you know, emails to make you aware of that, and then you can ask him some yeah. of these questions. Uh, yes, Spike, is there some place where you have already uh, presented the demonstration that you mentioned? I don't want you to have to go through this thing, if there's a way I can just watch it online, but we're talking about uh, the... I, I, I haven't, no. I'm, I'd like to hear it then. Okay, you I know, need... Your, does uh, anybody else want to hear a demonstration of sequence? Okay. Those of you who raised their, your hands might, be, might regret this now, because I need two volunteers. <laughs> <laughs> Come up on stage with me, and I, it, it won't be too embarrassing. The Nobody. Two, the, two <laughs> the two people who wanted to see it will right. volunteer. No, no, there was, there was more than two. Okay. I, I noticed some people are, are trying to leave the room, though. <laughs> okay. I need uh, one person on either, either side of me, please. This, this will be short, just a couple minutes. What, what's your name, sir? Tad. Tad. Nice to meet you. And your name, sir? Tracy. Tracy. Tad and Tracy. Okay. If we can stand here side by side, and we're going to do an experiment. I'm going to count backwards from three, and when I reach zero, all three of us are going to clap our hands simultaneously. We're trying to make it sound like one clap. 
And we've got to get it right because they're all going to judge us. <laughs> all right? We do that? Okay. You take your hand out of your pockets. <laughs> okay. Three, two, one. That, that was pretty good. What do you think? Yeah. Did we do it? Yeah. Okay. That's stage one. Is there a prize? Unfortunately, no. Oh. Now we're going to do a di different experiment. Um, instead of us being in the same room, we're going to simulate you being in a solar system one light year away from me in that direction, and you one light year in that direction. And importantly, you didn't start here and then move. You grew up and were raised there and whatever, as I, as I was here. And we're communicating via cosmic zoom call, so radio waves travel at the speed of light. So it'll take a year for a signal from, from me to reach either of you. Okay. okay. So I'm going to do the same experiment and tell you over the Zoom call, I'm going to clap my hands, three, two, one, on zero, let's all clap together. And I say three, two, one, and then I wait. It takes one year for the signal to reach you from me. So I'm just sitting here waiting. A year later, now we have to simulate this though, we win the space, but um, okay, so you wait here, we'll all see you in a year from now. <laughs> so and one year from now, you get the signal, three, two, one, and then you clap with me, right? Okay, now your signal travels back in this direction. It takes a year to reach me and another year to reach you. Meanwhile, the same thing is happening this way. So why did I, why go through this convoluted explanation? How did I perceive this sequence of events? I clapped alone. And then two years later, you two clapped together. One year later. No. A year, from, from my perspective, it took a year for the signal to reach you and then a year to get back to me. Oh, okay. So from my perspective, two years later, okay. I clap alone, two years later, you two clap together. I clapped before you two. What did you see? You and I clapped together before him who clapped two years later. What did you see? We clapped together before him who clapped two years after us. Which of the three of us are correct? You all. We all are, exactly. Depending on your perspective, the sequence of events can be different. There's frowns. <laughs> now, it may seem intuitive that my view should be correct, that I got, you know, me clapping alone is the real thing that happened. Okay, but what if you ran the experiment again, and this time there's a fourth person to your left, and you're the guy in the middle now? Now suddenly you get to perceive truth, and I don't? Does that work? No, the only consistent way to do it is we all perceive truth accurately. So we're all three of us perceiving differently what happened before other events, so before and after is different depending on who you are, where you are, and how fast you're moving on cosmic scales. So do, so do you see how that applies then to the idea about the galaxies being created and then everything arriving at the Earth? From the galaxy's perspective, they were created before the Earth was. From the Earth's perspective, we were created before the galaxies were because they didn't exist until day four, as far as we could tell. Well, n none of us were there, but you know what I'm saying. From an Earth perspective, so, so does, does that make sense to everybody? On large enough distance scales, sequences of events gets really strange, and different observers will observe it differently, and they're all correct. So thank you for being brave. OK. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm still experimenting with different ways to explain this, by the way. Did, did that make sense, or is that just too weird? Yeah. OK. Okay, don't be afraid to ask questions. <laughs> yeah, right. right. <laughs> Scared everybody off. No more volunteers, I promise. I was just curious uh, if we have an infinitely capable God, uh, could he not create an infinite speed of light? And could it not have decreased before we had the capability to technologically measure it to the point where currently the decrease is so small, we cannot detect that uh, with what we have to measure today? Uh, yes, however, that would have some, that would leave behind some evidence in the farthest objects that we see, um, is my understanding. So there, I agree with you. I mean, there's probably ways the Lord could do it that we, that we couldn't detect. 
Um, but a variety of people looked at that decreasing speed of light idea and tried to um, apply different angles to it. And for the most part, people have concluded that it's not really a, a useful um, thing to pursue anymore. So maybe there's, maybe there's an angle that uh, people haven't thought of. So I, I agree with you. Maybe there's a way. But if there is, we haven't found it yet. Anyone else? Yeah. Thank you so much for this presentation. My question is a basic one. Would you please clarify how astronomers today measure the distance to a star or a galaxy? Uh, there are multiple methods. They call it the distance ladder. We have some methods for measuring things close to us, and then we use those to calibrate methods to go farther and farther out. Um, on a close scale, we can measure even from the Earth out to a, roughly a few hundred light years. And we do that by tri triangulation. Um, similar to how surveyors measure distances on the ground, where you get two, a couple different views on things and see how the background looks different depending on your angle. And from that, do some geometry and figure out how far away that object is. Uh, in the case of a star, we can gauge its distance, if it's close enough to us, very close to us, by taking images of it on one particular day and waiting six months and taking an image of the same star. Because six months later, we've moved on the opposite side of the sun, which gives us the known distance between the two locations of the Earth, and then triangulate to the star and get its distance. That works out to a few hundred light years from observatories. There's been a couple of satellites that have then done that from space and brought it out even farther. That'll uh, get you to a few thousand light years, though, more or less. So what do you do from there? Well, what you do from there is you measure other things within that radius of things you can measure and use that to calibrate something further out. For example, there's a variable star, Cepheids, that it was discovered have a pattern, you know, they, they, they pulsate in, the, in their output. It was discovered that, that frequency is related to their brightness. So there's enough of us close by to where we could measure that for sure. That then allows us to apply that to something farther away. We see a star out in this other galaxy that's pulsating. Um, we don't know exactly how far away it is, but we do know we can measure how quickly it's pulsating. From that, calculate how inherently bright it must be. And then we know how inherently bright it is. We contrast that with what's called the apparent magnitude, which means the amount of light that actually reaches us, how bright it is when we receive it. And then we can calculate, OK, well, if we know it's that bright there, but so much dimmer here, how much space must there be in between for the light to have dimmed that much, and thus gauge the distance from there? So then we can use Cepheid stars as markers, if you will, that, oh, if there's a Cepheid within this galaxy, we can use it to calculate the distance to that galaxy using just that. And then there's other methods farther and farther out from there. Um, on the larger scales, they use redshift, which is based on a relationship between the stretching of the light beam and making it redder toward the red end of the spectrum. Uh, that's something we can measure directly. And based on a known relationship between the redshift and the distance, calculate the distance from that. So I don't know if you got lost on the details there or not. <laughs> uh, but what, the close ones we can, we can measure directly and then use that to like leapfrog and measure things farther and farther out based on calibrations of stuff closer. That's the basic, the most important point. Why is it assumed that the pulsating is consistent for all those? Stars? Because all the ones that we were able to measure the distance to, we can therefore know their inherent brightness you know, the, the apparent brightness is what we can measure from Earth. Inherent brightness is how bright it actually is, where it is. Uh, if, if you can measure the distance to it using another method, then you can figure out how inherently bright it must be. And by doing that several times, enough times, they realized that there's this relationship between inherent brightness and frequency. It was a really important advancement at the time. It's a, really, it's a very powerful technique. People are hesitant to ask questions now because of these long, detailed answers. OK, this will be a simple question. How big is it infinite? 
our ga the galaxies, the stars? Do they go on forever, or do they wrap back on themselves, or how is that? How well, big is it out there? Um, well, we can see out to almost, well, say about 13 and a half billion years at this point. The farther out we're looking, there's still things to be seen. Uh, and if I can, I ran down the same rabbit trail last night, sorry, Heinz, but. <laughs> to, yeah, okay. Um, brings up a point which no one has asked, but I'll mention anyway. The James Webb Space Telescope. You've heard of that? Just launched. This enables us to see farther into space that we, than we could before. We're still seeing, the farther and farther out we look, even with this new instrument, there's still more things out there, which is fascinating and fun from our side, causing problems on the secular side, because from their perspective, they're, they're looking out into time, because they think the whole distant starlight thing represents exact time, you know, absolute time, et cetera. Um, so they think they're looking 13 and a half billion years into the past. They're seeing stuff as it was 13 and a half billion years ago. The entire universe is only supposed to be 13.8 billion years. So they think they're seeing stuff as it was 250 to 300 million years after the Big Bang. Still with me? The models initially predicted stars and galaxies would need over a billion years, that's a thousand million years to form, and, pr and most of the time, I should correct myself, most objects would actually take longer than that. So their model said Big Bang happened. After one to two, maybe three billion years, galaxies were starting to form. The Hubble Space Telescope caused problems for that because it could look farther out and get to the th one to two to three billion year range, and there's mature galaxies there where the model says there can't be any yet. James Webb is making the problem worse. It's getting back to where, according to their way of thinking, it's only been a couple hundred million years after the Big Bang, they're still finding mature galaxies where the model says can't be any. So I'm privately been expecting, maybe better than even odds on this one, they're gonna have to modify the Big Bang model to give it more time. Because we keep finding stuff where their model says there can't be any. So it, it's fun to watch. Hope that wasn't too much of a tangent. Okay, I think we'll bring this uh, Q&A to a close, and uh, Spike will be available to yes. uh, talk some more about other issues you may have. Let's give him a hand for... Thank you. The... Thank you for your attention. So, uh, as I said, the, the way we um, support this ministry is we... Um, suggest donations that if you want to support the ministry just there's two boxes in the back just um, put it in there you could also donate online there's a donate button on our first uh, on the web page you can use that if you'd rather do that as well and we just thank you for that support as I mentioned on the back table there is a, a lot of different flyers of events that to come including the uh, creation tours that Ron talked about and uh, there's also some uh, pamphlets from other ministries on that back table. They're all there for the, for the taking. And then uh, resources are back there on the tables. You know, Spike's uh, three DVDs are there. And we also, from the Apologetic Forum, have a lot of other ones uh, there as well. Um, we do have some refreshments if you want to take advantage of that. And also, um, there, there's a whole, there's two boxes of uh, acts and facts put out by um, ICR, and some of us have collected a whole bunch of these over the years, and um, we're going to make some of those available for free. Uh, one person has already picked up a few, but there's two boxes of these acts and facts. If you want them, take them home and enjoy uh, them. So let me just close in a word of prayer, and we'll be dismissed. Uh, hang on, let me just note on the slide a reminder that um, Phil Fernandez will be here uh, next month, June the 23rd, and he's going to be talking on uh, the history of Western thought and the implications on our culture. Uh, Phil has been here many times before, and uh, he's always a very interesting uh, speaker for us. So. 
Father, we come to you, to you this evening just to, again, thank you for this time. Thank you for Spike's ministry and for his uh, explanations. One of the most difficult questions that uh, creationists have and others have about uh, how you created, Lord. We just thank you that you have given us much information to uh, see the glory in your creation, in your universe, and even in our earth as well. We thank you for that. Bless now the results of this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.